Greetings. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as I was uh, praying and preparing for the messages that I was going to be sharing today, I uh, was thinking about uh, the phrase, I thought. And I thought is an interesting phrase. The phrase carries such a myriad of emotions, expectations, disappointments, excitements, the potential for joy, sorrow, or anything in between. And I believe it's partially an action of the mind developed based on our experiences. I know that there are different ways folks think that go into, get, go into it beyond education, like training, life experiences, etc. And about 30 years ago, I was listening to a Focus on the Family broadcast with Dr. Dobson, and uh, he was interviewing someone on the way men and women think some of the differences and he explains that women have two X chromosomes and men have an X and a Y chromosome. I remember during the broadcast that they were that they said that while boys were developing in the womb that a Y chromosome floods the brain and it dissolves I don't remember the technical name for it but it was some type of transmission line between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And uh, that said that that is the reason why sometimes when a male is thinking about something, the woman can just blurt out the answer. And, and uh, men having these dissolved transmission lines have to go to Texas to get to New York, whereas a woman or a female needs to just go directly to New York. And we're trying to, we were trying to figure out the answer to something, and, and you're, you're, the man is, is trying to understand it and comprehend it, but then the woman just says, oh, it's the square root of 47.3524. Something crazy like that. The, an the ob it's obvious answer is that they, because of the way their minds work, that they're a little bit uh, quicker in some instances. I remember thinking that when I heard that, I've got brain damage. <laughs> and uh, I remember that to this day. And that was, like I said, about 30 years ago. It was printed on me. I don't remember all of the conversation, but I do remember that portion of it that he was talking about. But nothing like brain damage at all. The reality is, is that God created man and woman uh, unique. But apparently these two chromosomes really do determine so much about the body. And as an example of men and women thinking differently, there are some common differences generally among us. One of, uh, one of my favorites is women remember everything. Have you ever noticed women are always reminding men of their appointments? kids' activities or plans with friends, it is definitely known that women have better memories than men. And there is actually a reason for this. Women have a larger, and I may not be pronouncing this word correctly, but it's called um, hippocampus. This, uh, this hippocampus is where the, uh, the memories are stored, and that is why women can recall pretty much anything and everything. And even from that argument five years ago, uh, some, uh, so, so men, there's no reason to try to waste your time trying to store needless information because it'll get recalled when it's necessary. So I remember my mom when I was younger, prior to me joining the Navy, she always used to tell me, she says, no, David, don't worry about it. And so I never worried about it. But what I didn't know was that she was always worrying about it. And so today, I don't worry about it. Darla does. <laughs> and... Uh, so there's some inherent differences in the way not just men and women think, but people. And not only our basic processes to think born into us, but also where we're from, what we've learned, life experiences. And it's interesting. Ever hear, the, the, hear of common sense? Well, I think the older I get, the less I think we have more sense in common. I see people do some pretty crazy things, and then that phrase comes to my mind, common sense, and then I begin to realize, you know, that it's not so common at all. So a few weeks ago, this phrase caught my attention, I thought. Now, maybe because I was reading in 2 Kings 5, and uh, we'll be there in a little bit, but it kind of stuck with me, and I wanted to think just a little bit about that or talk a little bit about that for just a bit. And when we think on these things, that phrase, I thought, there is an expectancy. I'm either going to succeed or fail, um, or I'm either, or whatever the situation is, fill in the blank. I thought or I think about something. Thoughts on the positive side, you see satisfaction, accomplishments, as in, I thought I could do that. I thought I was never going to make that work. 
or similarly, you see these kind of processes that we each individuals have. But on the negative, you can dwell on the wrong things that can drag you down, life's circumstances, tragedy, habits, bad life experiences, etc. Thoughts from our experiences are powerful. and They can push you onto success or they can hinder your life forever or somewhere in between. There are people in the Bible that God uses examples to us. Those thoughts turned into actions where were recorded for us, some based on training or learning. And one of those individuals is Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5, and we'll read um, those few verses through uh, 9 through 15. So Naaman, Naaman went on with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a message to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. So even in that particular verse there, he had this assumption because of where Naaman had come from. Naaman was He was a proud man and he was a commander. And so in that position, he was used to people doing what he said. There was the expectancy that there was no question. And uh, he knew his men. He knew what to expect when they were to, they were surrounding him or something was needed of him. And so he had that mindset. And we often do those kind of things where we expect things. I have uh, observed individuals who've been put in places of leadership or they're, in the position in life that they are, there is this expectancy for people to respond in different ways. And so I can understand where Naaman was coming from because it's easy to lose sight of that. And so he says, I thought. Interesting that he, would, he almost had it all worked out how Elisha was going to work in this situation. Verse 12 says, Are not Abana and Fafar, the rivers of Damascus, better Then all the waters of Israel, couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. And even in that verse there, it's interesting because you see, it doesn't matter how clean the waters were anywhere. It doesn't matter if if Naaman jumped into a fountain. It didn't matter at all because the, the main thrust of what God was telling him through Elijah was that be obedient. And his servant goes on to say that in verse 13. He says, Naaman's servant went to him and said, my father... If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you to wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and he became like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept this gift from your servant. That's really kind of a neat story, the whole thing. But you see, Naaman was upset because he was a very proud man. He thought, as I mentioned, or the word says, he had never received treatment like this from before. The Lord is not only going to heal his leprosy, but he's also going to heal him of his pride. Generally, when God saves you, he takes out of your life the things that offends and in Naaman's particular case, pride was one of them. And those are, pride is one of the things that's, that God happens to hate. Another individual was Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 4, we'll read verse 30, 28 through 37. It says, in this, this particular portion of scripture, Nebuchadnezzar had received a dream. Daniel interpreted it and said that what we're about to read was going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. But it took a little bit of time. And that's the interesting thing. Sometimes when we hear things and there's a little bit of a time span in between that, we tend to forget. And um, sometimes we think that God didn't hear it or it was more human than it was um, spiritual. But here we find in this particular verse that coming to pass. In verse 28, it says, All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence? By my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty, you can see where this is going. 
Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what I decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from your people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by for, for you until you acknowledge. And this is the difference right here in this word acknowledge. In that he's saying, because you thought that it was by your hand, it was your thoughts that caused you to wander and to go astray and to think that you did all these great things, but it wasn't. But that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. And then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an internal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heavens and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. That's a beautiful portion of scripture when you read those things because of what Nebuchadnezzar had to go through to understand who God was. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of times that we go through things and sometimes we just don't get the message. We focus on things rather than the one who can change circumstances. Moses is another one of those individuals, and we won't go into a whole lot about Moses because we've, we, we know who he is and pretty much his life story. But from the, uh, up until the end of chapter 2, we see Moses as he is the son of Pharaoh, steps through the son of Pharaoh being raised in his house. And he had those luxuries that afforded those type of people. He had everything he wanted. And apparently a little bit of that pride got in his way as he was watching those Egyptians kill that uh, or bother those Israelites. But in chapter 3, we see Moses was, was chased out of Egypt or fled Egypt for 40 years. And um, during those 40 years... Uh, God did a work in his life, and in that desert place, he was scrubbed of everything. Everything that he had was gone. The position, the notoriety, everything. God had, had been taken from him, living in that dry and difficult land. And, and I tell people that ask me, they, you know, like I work over at one of the bases here, and, and people are saying, you live in San Diego, this is a great place. I said, and I think to myself, this is a desert I mean, we, it, it sure looks beautiful, but it's watered from the Colorado River and some from the mountain snows that come down. I said, you take that away and we're, we're a desert. But uh, it's still a nice place right now because of the way it is. But Moses was out in the middle of this desert and he was wiped of everything. And so it's no wonder that as uh, he was in, in this wilderness watching these sheep, for these 40 years, all of his pride was taken away and God brought him to a place where he could use him. And Moses was known as a very humble individual. But you see what happened with the environment that he was in. The other two, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Naaman, they were, they were almost put into a position where they began to realize or thought that they were something. Moses, on the other hand, had everything taken away from him, a humble individual. Another person that we see in the Old Testament, we know uh, much about this man, David sought God as a youth, and he made some mistakes, but God was merciful to him, and he used him in many ways, and we learn a lot about that individual. And it's, to some degree, both Moses and David are examples for us today because of the relationship they had with God. Someone from the New Testament that we've seen is Paul, arguably one of the greatest figures in the New Testament next to Jesus. 
from the new, uh, growing up, striving to be successful in the, the world's eyes, he was arrested by the Lord on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Money and influence was very powerful then, and it's very powerful today in our world. But Paul humbled himself and chose to accept God's call and be used by God, a servant, rather than a religious leader. And so as I was thinking about this, I thought, can anybody, anybody here, name a member of the Sanhedrin other than Joseph of Arimathea, the one who took Jesus' body at the, at the cave, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, where he came to Jesus by night, or Gamaliel, who was the, a strong, powerful leader in the Sanhedrin who taught Paul. Apart from those three, can anybody name anybody in the Sanhedrin? I couldn't think of anybody. And probably what would have happened to Paul is that you would have never heard another word about him. If it didn't identify him as holding the clothes as Stephen was being stoned, you'd probably never heard a word about him again because he would have just vanished into nothingness or into history. But today we know him because God used him in a powerful way. Um, he humbled him to the point of where he used him. And now, as I said, he is one of the probably greatest characters in the New Testament. Because of that relationship with God, thoughts become actions in our lives. The Bible tells us that the things we dwell on, say, or act upon determine the condition of our heart. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37 say, Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brought a viper, speaking to the religious leaders. How can you, who are evil, say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. I don't know about a lot of folks, but personally, I think to myself, how could God love me? You know, you know you better than anybody, and I know me better than anybody, but being a perfectionist or committed to excellence, as I have been corrected, I know all about my failures and my shortcomings, particularly in relationship to God. Like God couldn't love me, Look at all the things I've done, how many times I've failed him, how many times I've grieved the Holy Spirit, the crazy things that I say, sometimes at the spur of a moment. But the reality is, it doesn't matter what we think or whether we think God loves us or not. The reality is, he does. The Bible tells me he does love you and me. And it's precisely because of our sins and our failures that he went to the cross. For those reasons, he went to the cross. He knows we are prone to wander. They don't call him the good shepherd for nothing. And, and really, that's not a compliment to mankind. I suspect uh, we failed all too often. So as I was meditating on these things, the question came into my heart. Do you follow Christ because of what he could do for you or because of what he's done for you? Do you follow Christ because of what he could do for you or because of what he's done for you. If you follow Jesus for what he's done for you, meaning you've accepted him as Lord and Savior and that is the purpose for following him, then there's joy in your life. If you're waiting for him to deliver you from something or a loved one from something for some physical or financial issue, you're probably not living with much joy in your heart. There's always that doubt because God didn't answer your prayer as of yet. And that's why me, we ask ourselves, why not me? Why or why me? Why do I have to fall in these kind of situations? Or, or why not me? How come I don't get all these blessings? You never have joy because you're looking for a pot of gold and you know, I'm just a super, no, I'm not really superstitious, but you know, you look at that rainbow in the sky and you, you've heard that little story, you know, there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know, I've seen the end of rainbows, there ain't no pot of gold, unless someone got it there before I did. But your pot of gold might be a healing or something like that. Not to say God couldn't do it, but it is not and never will be the joy that Christ promised. 
anything that God does in your life apart from salvation will never be the joy that he promised in your life. It's like winning a lottery ticket. Not to say that it's a gamble, but there's joy when you get money in the mail, but it's only temporal. It's the same thing when we get healed. I mean, we might talk about it, but it's not going to be an everlasting joy that God creates in our lives like when we get saved. It only comes with a right relationship with Christ. And just as, just as Jesus, or Jesus had just finished teaching the crowd about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Great, strange thing, but they didn't understand it. So in John chapter 60, we'll read on through 26, or through 68. It says, Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? But Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. And he said unto them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? Is it the spirit that quickeneth? It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning that they were that believed not, or who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him from the Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked away no more with him. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. And as I read these things, it's exactly true. We sing the song oftentimes, Where could I go? When we have tasted and seen the goodness of God, when we have felt his presence in our lives personally, there is nothing, nothing in this world that can take the place of that relationship with God. There is not a physical, material person in this world that can do in a moment what Christ can do in our lives, and it's eternal. It lasts forever. John chapter 6, verse 22, it says, The day following... When the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one wherein his disciples had entered, and that Jesus was not with him and his disciples in the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came another boat from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. After that, the Lord had given thanks." When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when, when comest thou? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And as you read these things, you see that they didn't come to be spiritually fed by Jesus. They didn't come to hear about the kingdom of God. They came for physical satisfaction. Do you follow Jesus for what he could do for you or what he's done for you? We don't serve Christ because of what he could do for us. He's already done the greatest work that we could have ever imagined by going to the cross for us. If we are looking to Jesus for something that he could do for us, I got to tell you, it's a miserable life. I, have, I read of a man in John chapter 5 who had a sickness for 38 years. He was poor, he was helpless, he was hopeless, he was homeless, and he was lonely. John chapter 5, 5 through 7. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step down before me. This individual was in a miserable place. And we have to realize that we are uniquely made special in God's eyes. It doesn't matter how we are. It doesn't matter how we're made. It doesn't matter if we have handicaps. It doesn't matter what that condition is. There was another man in Acts chapter 3. He was lonely, dependent on individuals to carry him around, no self-esteem, beaten down. 
Acts chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. This man, was a, he was there from his mother's womb. So he had always been carried to that gate. I don't know how long it was, but it was a long time because it says he was a man in this verse. So he'd been in this condition for quite a while. These two individuals, as well as others in the Bible, particularly the woman with the issue of blood, having that for 12 years, spent all that she had trying to cure this disease. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, what's the problem? I mean, we understand cancer and we know that they don't have a cure for that yet. But in those days, it wasn't it was nowhere near like what we have today. They would bring concoctions in of crazy things and ask them to drink it and state that it would heal them and it would do nothing. They didn't have the, the methods the technology that we have today. So we have to consider their lifestyles. But these three individuals, particularly, they, their condition was their life. They thought about that condition every moment of the day, and it, uh, it arrested them, their thoughts. It stole their life, and it stole their hope. They had nothing to live by because they were dwelling on situations. You know folks who may be in a similar situation in your, that, that live around you or maybe even live with you. Maybe you are one. Beaten down by life and waiting for the waters to be troubled for deliverance. Those folks are lonely, lost, angry, bitter, hostile because of what life has dealt them. Or they have chosen that path and they have chosen that path. They might even go to church. It's interesting, but I heard on K-Love yesterday, um, Christian radio station, Darla and I were driving around, and this testimony came on about this. Uh, that she seemed to be a young woman, sounded like it, but she was talking about how when she was born, she was born without hands, and that she had always blamed God for her being born in the condition that she was. And she was in the same situation, angry at God, and and there came a point in time when people would be starting to tell her that she was an inspiration to them. And then she began to realize that she could use this handicap to minister to other people. And so when she started to turn her thought process around, she began to praise God for the privilege that she had, because now she has a Christian ministry where she ministers to handicapped kids because she's not alone in, her, in this, this thinking that she had, but there are other people in the same situation, and she was able to help them out of those situations. We don't serve God because of what he can do for us. We serve him because of what he's done for us. When we serve God for what he's done for us, we keep that in focus. All other things just kind of fade away. Luke chapter 4 Verses 18 and 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he hath anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In that verse, it says, He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners or set the captives free. You can be held captive by many things today. Thoughts are among them. It's the captor that may not be visible. It's not chains on your hands, but it's the inside. And oftentimes it is visible on people's countenance, their actions, their behaviors. They scream they are captive to something. Whatever that may be, Jesus has come to set us free. He is the one who can release us from those, bound, those binds, that, that there are those chains that bind us, whatever that is in our life. And he wants to do that for you and me today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege that we have. And God, you see each one of us who are listening to this. And there are some with deep chains in their lives, Lord, that they are bound to because of maybe what has happened in their past. And God, I pray that today you would set us free from those things. Help us, Lord, to realize what they've done to us, Father, how the enemy has used those to steal our life. God, help us to re repent of that before you, that we've allowed these, these situations, these, 
these binds to, or to take our life away. And, and Lord, we haven't focused on the author of life. We haven't given you the praise and the glory that you deserve. So Lord, forgive us of these things and set us free as you declared through your word. Father, we praise you and we thank you. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.